Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your spirit revives, your spirit reveals you to us. Our souls now thirst for our great God. Lord, we stand ready for your word. Oh, send your light and truth and we'll rise up to you. Lord, we come. To your word we have come Now we come Lord by your spirit you've drawn us to you Lord we come With hearts open wide unto you Speak your word Let Jesus be glorified let us pray. Eternal Father, we thank you for this morning. We bless you, we honor you, we glorify you. We thank you for this wonderful privilege to be called your children and to have access to the throne of grace. Lord, be exalted in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, it is our prayer that you will breathe upon your word this morning, that your word will bring life to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Your word will bring encouragement and instructions in righteousness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, let our hearts be quickened. Let our hearts be encouraged Amen. as we continue on this journey of life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Equip us, Lord. Strengthen, strengthen us, Lord. Perfect our work, Lord, Amen. in the name of Jesus. Be exalted, Father, for in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen, amen and amen. amen. So very briefly this morning, I will be speaking on a message titled, embracing God's help. The Lord is speaking to us this morning about his help that he wants he wants us to embrace his help. Let's look at our key scripture for this message this morning, Psalm 18 verse 29. I think a few years ago this was one of the core anchor scriptures for the word the Lord gave us for that particular year. But the Lord is bringing it to us in a different way today. Psalms chapter 18, verse 29. He says, with you, ah, no, give me King James. Say, for by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I lived over a war. Who has NIV? If you have NIV, please read for Ross. With your help, with your help, I can advance against the troop. I can advance against the troop. With my God, With my God I, can scale a wall. I can scale a wall. See, the psalmist here was talking about the challenges of life, the troubles of life. That, you know, we are all faced with at different times or the other. Amen. Amen. You know, in life there are different seasons. There are times you are in a season of joy and excitement. You cannot even explain it at times why you are happy, but you are happy. How many people understand what I'm talking about? There are other seasons of achievements that is almost like before you touch the thing, the answer has come. Before you ask for it, you have received it. How many people understand what I'm saying? But as we have those wonderful seasons, there are other seasons when things are more challenging, when things are more difficult, and you are even wondering why. Amen. Apostle Paul was speaking in the book of Acts of Apostles. He said, so that I will not become conceited by the abundance of revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to remove it. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. What was he saying? There was a time in his life, not a time, a long season, where he was working in great revelation. If you read that place in 2 Corinthians, um, sorry, act, uh, what am I saying? Is this 2 Corinthians now where he was saying? Where he said it? Anyway, I'm not going to look. I will look at it and give you the exact reference for my notes. But what I'm saying is, before that, I was in 2 Corinthians, yes. Before that time, he spoke about a lot of revelations that God gave him. So much so that he said, although he didn't want to say it directly, that God took him even into heaven. And he saw paradise. 
and he had words from the Lord. He was being humble. He said, I know a man. But by the time you finish reading it, you know that he was talking about himself. Amen. But you know, he saw all those things. He had great revelations. It was a season. But after that beautiful season, then he was given a thorn in the flesh. Something that he didn't want in his life came, happened to him. He wanted to push it away. He didn't go away. Hallelujah. He wanted to excuse himself from it. There was no way the thing was going to go away. Hallelujah. And the Bible said he was given a thorn in the flesh. This thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. A messenger of Satan to buffet him. A messenger of Satan to trouble him. Hallelujah. Amen. And you know, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, please take this thing away from me. I don't want this thing in my life anymore. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, but the Lord said, my grace is what? Is sufficient for you. Which means I'm not going to take it away. I will only give you grace to, to, to bear it. Hallelujah. Amen. So there are different seasons. There are seasons of, of joy, seasons of excitement. There are seasons of challenges, seasons of trouble. And when we are in the season of trouble, what do we do at that kind of time? Because you see, this is the point where a lot of people fail. They give up on God. They say, well, God, if you are truly there, you, 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 you should not have allowed this to happen. Amen. Amen. You remember the story of Lazarus, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Amen. Amen. You remember the story. When Jesus eventually showed up, the two of them at different times made the exact same statement. What was it? Lord, if you had been here, they were complaining. Lord, if only you were here. If only you were... But listen, that is not how it is actually. The thing is that it was just a season because eventually Lazarus rose up from the dead. Amen. Amen. So where am I going? There are different seasons in our lives. See, he says for my... He said, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. So there are times in our lives that we, we are in a state of weakness. We are in a state of confusion. We don't know what to do. But the Lord comes through for us. So the psalmist here was saying, look, by the help of the Lord, I can scale a wall. By the help of the Lord, I can run through the troop. You know, there is something I love about the people of CAC extraction. They pray a lot. And it's wonderful. It's great to pray. But there is something they also say that always makes me, you know, those are my friends. I used to tease them. Every little thing is, 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 is the battle. No, it's not even just prayer. I don't have any problem. They say, ah, if sometimes they say, oh, guni. <laughs> Hallelujah. If this happens, oh, guni. Now, the truth of the matter is that at times, oh, guni, oh. At times, yeah. At times, it can be a demonic attack. You can be under the oppression of the enemy. Am, am I making sense to you? At times, you can be under real oppression of the enemy, real attack of the enemy. Am, am I making sense to you? But at times, it might just be a season. You are just passing through a challenging time. Praise the Lord. But you know the Yoruba translation of that Psalms chapter 18, verse 29? He said, Nikpa eron lawa lorun mo le la ogun koja. Which means, truly, even if it's now the oppression of the enemy, by the help of the Lord, what will I do? I can run through the troop. The Lord will give us grace. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, today we are talking about embracing God's help. Listen to me, friends. As children of God, as believers, from time to time, God steps into our lives, into our situations to help us when we are in trouble. When we are challenged, when we are confused, he steps in to help us. The problem many times is that many of us do not recognize God's help or we do not even know how to embrace the help of God. Am I making sense to you? We do not even know how to embrace it. But God is interested at all times in our lives, whenever we are faced with challenges, whenever we are faced with trouble, he's interested in stepping in for us. So hold that in one hand. I want to lay the foundation of this message in a more robust way. So now, there, was this, there is this great writer, one of my, I would say my best secular writer, is a man called Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know how many of us have read any of his books, but a great author, fantastic man. He has written several books. He's not a Christian writer. I say my, sec, my best secular author. So I read secular books. I read spiritual books. Amen. Amen. So he's a great author. I encourage you to read his books. You will learn a lot. 
So in one of his books, Outliers, and I will encourage you to read that book, fantastic book, he told a story of one of the greatest tech geeks, some of the, one of the people that became one of the greatest person in tech, in the history of tech, at least as we have seen it up till today. And you know, he spoke a lot about the history of the person. He wrote about different histories, different stories. But what was he trying to say as he was addressing the story? I'll come back to the details of the story. You know what he said? He was talking about success. That's what the book is about. That why are some people successful? What are the factors for success? Why is it that some people will start this way, some other people will start the same way or at the same place? One will become really successful, the other will not be successful. So he began to analyze different factors. And fantastic book, you will, be, you will be blessed, I would say, and you will learn a lot if you read it, the different factors that make for success. And I just want to now look at one, then narrow it down. You know what he said? I've, outside many things, he spoke about education, he spoke about the family you come from, he spoke, things that make people succeed. He spoke about language of, of, of teaching, of learning, because he said that is a very important matter. But there's something he now said. He said, for many people who are successful, one of the secrets is that they had help along the way. Somebody helped them along the way. And you know, what he was saying was that in the book, he was demystifying success. That many times when we say someone is successful and we think that he, there are people who are super intelligent, super genius, hallelujah. Amen. However, there are certain things that, that are similar on their journey, if you analyze it. And one of the factors he brought up was that he had help, and some of them have help along the way. Somebody just steps in at a critical time to help you. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Somebody steps in to help you. So he told the story of this particular tech geek, that when he was a young, young, uh, young boy, I would say, because I think he was still less than 20, he had become a computer enthusiast. He loved computing and everything. But we didn't have computers. They didn't have computers like the way we have it now. In fact, those days, they had only mainframe computers that are operated by punch cards. You see, some of those mainframe computers are bigger than this entire room that we are in. That's how big some of them can be. And only God knows how many people can be operating them at the same time. You know, very old thing like that, boy. It's the same technology that was crunched into all these things that we have now. Crunched into desktop, crunched into laptop, crunched into tablet, crunched now into phones. Now crunched even into our wristwatches, you know? You know, a lot of our wristwatches are now even computerized. But you see, in those days, we had not come to this level of technology. I'm going somewhere. So this boy, he was so enthusiastic about computing, but he didn't have access to real computers. So he had read a lot, done a lot, but that was it. So he went visiting his uncle. Interestingly, he now found out that the company where his uncle worked, because he went from one town to the other, he found out that in the company where the uncle worked, they had that big computer. And the uncle was the one in charge. So somehow he convinced the uncle to let him even see it. You know, because he, he, he was in love with it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So the uncle to obtained permission from the company, and he said, the thing is just there, we, we use it, but not so much. He's a young man, let him explore. And the guy was on holiday, I think he had finished school, so he had like maybe a year or two, just free in his hands. Every morning, he would go to the office with his uncle, he would go into the computing room, he would just be looking, he would be testing different things, and he, would, he invested many hours. According to Malcolm Gladwell, he said, if you want to be a professor, uh, you know, a, a super uh, user of anything, you must invest at least 10,000 hours, personal hours into it, and it's true. Now, by the time the year passed, and this young man was to go back to, to, his, to college, now, nobody knew, nobody saw him all those times. He would just go into the place, spend morning till night. The uncle had to always drag him home. It's time to go home. He would drag him home. The following morning, he's back. He learned everything about the computer that by the time he got back, he had a lot of ideas and he was one of the people that started trying to put it into a smaller version. Do you understand? Eventually, he became one of the most celebrated persons. What happened to him? He found help along the way. Am I making sense to you? 
somebody helped him along the way. The same way, in different areas, people help us along the way. Even in the matters of the faith. You remember I shared with you the story of John Mark and Barnabas. You remember the story? You remember the story I shared with you? When, which, which um, where is it now? In Acts of Apostles, chapter 15. Go to verse 36. Let me read it. I'm talking about embracing God's help. And there is a reason why I'm dancing round and dancing back and forth this way. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Okay, you can open it in your Bible while we wait. All right, good. He says, and some days after Paul, some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Let's go. And Barnabas determined, and Barnabas determined to take with, with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take with him to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Let's go on. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder. That is, they went in different directions. One, they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. 40. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren Unto the grace of God. So you know, you understand the story. You know the story. So what happened? They got there. They had gone on the first missionary journey. They came back. They wanted to now go and visit the brethren, all the souls they've won. So they now said, Paul, uh, what's his name? Barnabas said, now that we are going a second time, let's, uh, let's take John Mark again. There was one of the brothers called John Mark. He said, let's take John Mark. Hallelujah. He said, let's take John Mark with us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And what is the name of the other person? Uh, Paul. Paul said, no, I don't want us to take John Mark with us. Amen. Amen. He said, ah, let's take John Mark. Ah, no, we are not going to take John Mark. So they said, why don't you want to take John Mark? They said, we don't want to take John Mark because when we went on the first journey, John Mark was with us. And at some point, whatever happened to him, whether he just got tired or he got angry, he left us and just... He left us on the field and walked away. And Paul was still angry. Amen. Amen. So he didn't want to take John Mark. Barnabas said, well, I cannot argue with you that what John Mark did was right. But I want to take him anyway. This second time. The Bible said the two apostles, because Paul and Barnabas were apostles, they had such a sharp argument that they parted company. They stopped doing ministry together. One went this way, the other went that way. But do you know that if you read the scriptures further, and I have all the scriptures I can show you, but that's not what I'm teaching today. If you read the scriptures further, you will realize that John Mark truly made a mistake at first. He did something wrong at that time. He left them in the field and did not support the work of ministry. But do you know what happened to him? After Barnabas took him, God rearranged his life. God corrected all his errors. And then, you know what happened? He then rose up to be a good believer again. In fact, he was the one that wrote the book of Mark that we have been reading. It was after Barnabas helped him. Say, yes, you are a bad boy. You didn't behave well. You are a rascal. <coughs> but now, are you ready to change your ways? Say, yes, I'm ready to change my ways. Okay. And reshaped his life. He didn't lose his destiny. He didn't lose God's plan for him. Then God positioned him back into his destiny. And he became what God wanted him to become. Amen. Amen. So much so that even Paul the apostle, later, when he had some problems in ministry, in fact, actually he was in prison. They had caught him. Paul suffered a lot. So they caught him again and put him in prison for his faith. He said, please go and tell John Mark to come. Bring John Mark. He's, he's profitable, he's useful to me in the work of ministry. Say, ah, ah, the same John Mark. So we said we should throw him away. So, what was Barnabas to John Mark? Help along the way. Listen to me, friends. The way God has ordained this Christian work is that as we go on, there will be help along the way. 
You must understand and recognize when you meet someone who is your help along the way. Most of the time, the problem with a lot of believers is that we miss our Barnabas. That person that wants to help us shape in our lives so that we become what God wants us to be. We miss them. We are looking somewhere else. We are so distracted. We say, oh, this is what I want to do. We miss our Barnabas until we run into trouble. But God is merciful. God rearranged the life of John Mark. Eventually, John Mark still fulfilled his destiny. John Mark has been blessing generations upon generations till today. We have all read this book. Praise the Lord. That was help along the way. But now, coming back to our message for the day, that was just the introduction. See, beyond help along the way, there is something that the Lord has promised us his children. It is his own, himself being our helper. Am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. Let me tell you something, friends. As children of God, God is our helper. Many times people will say, ah, if you are born again, if you are a child of God, you cannot make it in this world. Do you know that what they are saying kind of makes sense? If you are a genuine child of God, because when you know what people do to make it, you say, if you want to live like a real child of God, you probably not make it. Am I making sense? But again, what they have said is not correct. It's because they do not understand the scriptures. Because for the believer, God is our helper. And you see, according to Malcolm Gladwell, yes, you find help along the way for you to succeed. Somebody will help you. Somebody will support you. However, for the child of God, God himself is your help along the way. Am I making sense to you? God can position people to help you. But beyond human beings, God himself is your help along the way. Now let's look at scriptures. Because this is what I just want you to go home with today. That as you are going home, and I don't know why God gave me this message to share. It came to me specifically and very clearly that I should speak to the church about embracing the help of God. Don't feel alone. You are not alone. Whatever you are going through, whatever challenges you are facing, you are not alone. God is with you. Am I making sense with you? Making sense to you? God is with you. He cannot leave you. Let me tell you something. He has made a promise and a commitment. There is an example I always like to, to use, and it's dealing with children. If I tell any of us, those of us that have children, if you tell a child, a little child now, after the service, I will give you sweets. What will the child say? The child, as far as he's concerned, he has received the sweet. Is it not true? He will, in fact, already will start boasting to his friend. When my daddy gives me the sweet, I will not give you. <laughs> he has not even seen the sweet. But you know, why is he so confident? He trusts the daddy. He trusts the daddy. When my, he will boast to his friend, let me play with your car, your toy car. That one says, no, don't play with my car. My daddy is going to give me sweet after service. He has not seen the sweet, but he believes. He trusts the father. Maybe because the father, all the time he promised, he didn't fail. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I leave you to chew on that one. So when you promise your children things, don't fail. No. Hallelujah. But God himself is our help along the way. The journey of life, the journey of ministry is a challenging one. Our journey, even if you are in career, if you are in business, there is no one that is easy. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, somebody was doing paid employment. He said, ah, I'm tired of saying yes, sir, yes, sir, to anybody. I'm going to start my business. <laughs> Those who have been in business, they welcome to the world. Because somewhere in his mind, he thinks, now I can sleep till night. That People are leaving paid employment and they want to go and do business. That's how they are thinking. They say, ah, all this waking up by five and somebody will be rushing and we're going to VI. I will wake up. It should be my business. I'm running my business. It's all right. That's when you realize that by the time you get to the market, those, some people got there 5 a.m. Should be that time before you will leave home by 5 a.m. Some people got there 5 a.m. and they are sold to all the customers. By the time you get there, you are just finding yourself. Everybody has, all the real customers have bought and they have gone home. Hallelujah. So there can be challenges along the way. There can be troubles. Whatever you do, nothing is easy. Nothing is cheap. But when there are troubles along the way, there is an assurance that children of God must have. You know what, is, what the assurance is? God is with me. Hallelujah. 
even in the eye of the storm, in the face of trouble, God is what? Put your hand on your chest and say, God. God. You didn't say it very well. Say, God, God. Is, is with me. With me. Even in the eye of the storm. You didn't say it very well. Even when I'm in the eye of the storm, God, God is with me. With me. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's look at let's look at the at the scriptures and we'll analyze it in, you know in a bit. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And this is our scripture for today. I'll read verses 5 and 6. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Can we have the simpler one? Let's see if it helps us. Okay, this might, this might help us. He says, your life should be free from the love of money. As children of God. Be satisfied with what you have. But why should you be satisfied with what you have? Because there is a reason. You can't just say be satisfied with what you have. Amen. Amen. When others are getting more and gathering more. Ah, are you stupid that you also will not gather more? There is a reason. Say, so be satisfied with what you have. Why? For he himself, that is God, has done what? Has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. This is the reason why we are content as believers. This is the reason why even when we don't know what to do in the eye of the storm, there is a promise that God has made to his children. He said, I will do what? Never. Let somebody say never. never. What does never mean? Never means that it won't happen. I love somebody, what somebody said now. He said, when I say never, it never means, he said never means never. <laughs> and I agree. God says, I will do what? Never. You know many times when certain things happen, to believers, and people begin to analyze. They will say, maybe it's because of what you said or what you did. God can chastise us, that is, discipline us when we do wrong. Am I making sense to you? He can discipline us, he can put us right, but he will not leave us. You don't understand what I'm saying? Even when we sin, am I making sense to you? Don't overglorify sin. I'm not saying sin is right. But even when we sin, God will take care and flog you. After flogging you, he will still be there with you. You, you don't get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, as parents, and you know, God is, is, we cannot even compare ourselves with God. When your children do wrong, whatever it is they do, and you are very upset, you discipline them, don't you? So you take a little kid, and you, 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 you whip their behind, and say, oh yeah, face the naughty corner. Although some people don't get whipped nowadays, it's just naughty corner. Some of us, the naughty corner wouldn't have helped us to where we are. So I really don't trust naughty corners. Hallelujah. Some people are looking at me now. I don't believe in naughty corner. I believe in the real one you get. The real one that we shake. The, they will always remember. They forget naughty corner. But if I give you the real hot one, the next time, that uh, thing that whispers into the children's ears, they say, go and do that thing. We say, this man, <laughs> he will give me another one. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when we go wrong, we sin, we go out of the way, God will chastise us. He will discipline us, but he will not leave us. So if your children go wrong and you discipline them, do you throw them outside the house? After disciplining them, your bad people will say, about for what? So if you discipline a child with the right hand, then you use the left hand to draw him close again. That's how God is. In fact, God is even much better than that. He will draw you close again. It's human beings that judge and say, and finality, you did wrong, you are finished. It's because we don't know the heart that God has. He's a loving, kind God. He loves us. Hallelujah. So, even when we stumble, when we go out of the way, the Bible said, he himself has said, I want NIV. And this... Brother Joseph, you have to do something about this NIV. We, I need to have NIV. NIV speaks to the way I want it to be presented. So, uh, Brother Biodun, help me with NIV. Keep your lives. Keep your lives. Free from the love of money. Free from the love of money. And be content with that what you have. Be content with what you have. Because God has said. Thank you. Because God has said. 
the reason why I'm saying be content, he said, because God has said, what did he say? Never will I leave you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Can you see it? I love NIV. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Hear me, friends. Sit down, sir. God will never leave you. It must be settled within your mind that when you are confused, when you are faced with trouble, God is always there to help you. He said, I will never leave you. And the word that the Lord has given me today is to present to you that the Lord himself will never leave you. You might look at yourself and you might feel alone. There are times in our lives that we feel alone. There are times that we face troubles and we feel alone. There are times that we seek help and we can't get the help. We feel alone. There are times people are even there to help us, but they cannot help us in this situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know some situations people cannot help you. There is nothing they can do about your situation. They feel sorry for you. They pity you, but, they, but God is saying, look, me, God, I will never leave you. He said, I will never, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. What does the word forsake mean? There is another word for it. Thank you. Never will I forsake you. Never will I abandon you. Listen, there are times that we are faced with so much trouble and we are wondering, Lord, where are you? The Lord says, I will never abandon you. Even in that time of trouble. I've told you a few times, some of the challenges I've faced in my life. There was a time in my life I faced so much challenges and I felt that the Lord has abandoned me. And at that time, I will go to the Lord in my closet in prayer. I will pray and pray and pray and pray. I will say, Lord, why are you? What are you doing? You will just... The only thing the Lord will do is he will just come. I will feel his presence around me. He will come, show me his presence, and he will leave. He didn't give me an answer. All through that time. Until when that season ended, then I received the word. It was a long time. But the Lord says, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Even when you are looking around and you think God has abandoned you, he has not. He said, he has promised. One translation says, this one says, for he himself has said. Then I will say, for God has said. One translation says, for he has promised. Let somebody say, God has promised. God has promised. He will never leave me. Yeah. You didn't say it very well. You are saying, yeah, you, you are sounding too weak. Like you don't even believe all this my noise that I'm making. Say, God has promised. God has promised. That he will never leave me. And he will never abandon me. In the name of Jesus. So now see this. I'm going to read this, then I'll go to verse 6. So, he said, For he himself has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Now go to 6. Because God will never leave you, because he will never forsake you, he said, Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. You are not just saying the Lord is my helper. Can you see where we are coming from? Where are we coming from? I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Whatever you are faced with. Whatever trouble you are faced with. Let me tell you, there are times we are faced with serious troubles. I know what I'm talking about. I have been faced with serious troubles before. But the Lord is saying, regardless of that trouble, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will still be with you in that challenge. And eventually, I will take you out of it. Because the Lord has now said he will never leave me, so what's going to happen? I also, we, may boldly say, the Lord is what? The Lord is my helper. Let somebody say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. Hear me, friends. It does not matter how difficult the situation is. The Lord is my helper. In my academics, the Lord is my helper. In my finances, the Lord is my helper. In my ministry, the Lord is my helper. In my business, the Lord is my helper. In my health, the Lord is my helper. In my marital life, the Lord is my helper. In the name of Jesus. Hear me, friends. The Lord is my helper. Why am I now confident? Why would I be able to say it confidently? Because he has promised. Just as the little child will rejoice when the father promises him candy or sweet or whatever, 
The same way I also become bold that the Lord is my helper. Even in the face of trouble, even in the face of challenges, the Lord is my helper. Hallelujah. Amen. And it does not stop there. I will what? Look at this. I will not be afraid. And I love the way this is now even presented here. Can you see that it's a full stop? The Lord is my, I am declaring that the Lord is my helper. And what? Let somebody say, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. Listen, whenever the enemy attacks us, you know what he tries to push into us? What is it? Fear. And once you, once you open the door to fear, many other things will come in. Hallelujah. Several other things will come in. Several other uh, attacks of the enemy will come in. So many times, you, are, you, you look at yourself, you feel a symptom in your body. And you say, what, is, what am I feeling? Hallelujah. You know what the devil wants to put into you? Fear. And once he puts the fear, you remember when we talked about the power of the spoken word? What do people do when they fear? They begin, my leg. I don't know what is wrong with it. I don't think it's this one. Ah, this is my hand. I don't think it's this one. You know what they are doing? As they are saying it, they are creating it. And that's what the enemy wants to do. Listen, you might be under the attack of the enemy. The Bible says, I will not be afraid. Look, do not allow fear in your heart. Regardless of what the enemy is throwing at you, regardless of the pain, the confusion, do not be afraid. It's a difficult thing to do, but your trust in the word of God is what will make you not to be afraid. He said he has promised. Oh, oh, the trouble I told you about. So, this particular challenge, man, it was so difficult in my family at that time. All I had left was the Lord. And... I will wake up at times in the middle of the night. I wake up. At times I don't even sleep through the night. Am I, am I making this sense? At times I can't even sleep. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm worried. Then when I, when I go into my prayer room, the devil will say it has finished. There is no need to pray. See what is on ground. See, everything has finished. It is gone now. The only thing I had left at that time was the Lord. And the Lord, that was why whenever I prayed, like I told you the other time, all the Lord will do is to prove to me that he's still around. He will just, I will pray, Lord, do so. He will just come. You know when you feel the presence of the Lord, he will come, he will, he will make sure I feel his presence. You know what he's telling me? I'm still around. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor the Lord is still around. So I will feel his presence, I will feel his glory. I will know he's still there. And that was the only thing I was left with. Just the presence of the Lord. I did not even realize at that time how powerful that presence of the Lord is. I did not realize it. Because he said, I will be with you always. Never will I leave you. Never will I abandon you. I will always be with you. And because the Lord is with me, I will declare boldly that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Let me tell you something, friends. I encourage people a lot to read the scriptures for themselves. Some people, I even force them. I give them no peace. I say, you must read the Bible. You must read it. Where did you read it? Yesterday, I read chapter 2. Some say, oh, Pastor, your wahala is too much. I say, yes, that's my calling and ministry. <laughs> to trouble you until you become what God has destined you to be. Hallelujah. Yeah. I remember there was a brother that I discipled somewhere in the past, sometime in the past. Oh, he wanted to run away at a point. I said, but, you know, by virtue of the arrangement of things, there was nowhere for him to run to. You know, some people cannot. This one could not run there. You are not going anywhere. So eventually, we, we, we kind of concluded the discipleship program. And I then went my way. I even left him. I went my way. He too went his way. Many years after, he calls me. And he says, ah, Pastor, how are you? I say, I'm doing great. I'm fine. God is good. He said, ah, I miss you. I say, you, you don't miss me. <laughs> he said, no. It's now that I realize all that you were saying. And I, I say, okay, amen. I thank God you realize it now. The depth of the word of God that you have is what will determine whether you will be afraid. Because when fear comes, you must answer fear with the promise of the Lord. If you don't have the promise of the Lord in your heart, and that's why, it's one of the reasons why I pressurize people at times. Okay, we are reading, I, I did it with some people here. I said, we are reading the New Testament. 
They say, hey, New Testament. Why do I still wondering? Eh? We will read the Old New Testament. I say it's going to be five times. Ah! Some of them, I looked at them that day. I said, you can't run out through the door. You're already here. You're not going anywhere. By the time they read it and read it themselves, all of a sudden, when challenges come, they don't tell me. They will say, I remember the scriptures that I read or the one that you shared with us and I applied it and it worked, sir. I will say, praise God forevermore. Understand also that even in the time of peace, your heart must be filled with the word of God. Because when trouble comes, that is what will help you not to be afraid. He said, for he himself, he has promised it is the promises of God that drives fear away. Am I making sense to you? I'm not teaching today. I have an exhortation, a message from the Lord. So now, because the Lord has promised, friends, make up your mind now to embrace the help that God is offering you. God wants to help you, whatever the situation is. One, he has proved that he will always be with you. He will never abandon you. He says he wants to help you. But what are you now going to do? You must accept his help. Amen. Amen. You must accept his help. You are going to the island. You don't have a car. I am also going to the island. I have a car. You are already trekking. I drive my car and I park beside you. I say, bro, enter the car. We are going the same way. What do I want to do to you? I want to help you. But do you know you have a decision to make? You can decide. Not to, not to get into the car. You say, well, I say, yeah, you want to know. My legs are fast. Ah, they told me when I was in primary school. Pak, 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 bye, bye. What did they do, butter? It's all right. I will, I, will, I will wish you Godspeed. I say, I bid you Godspeed, <laughs> and I will drive off. Hallelujah. Amen. You must be willing to accept the help that God is offering. You must be willing to accept the help that God is offering. When somebody accepts God's help, he recognizes that God wants to help me, and he accepts that help. His life will change. Troubles will go away. Then there will be great accomplishment beyond human understanding. I want to read to us the story of a man. He's in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 26. He was one of the kings of Israel. He became a king in Israel at the age of 16. And the Bible spoke about great things in the, lives of, in the life of this man. He accomplished great things. In fact, he was one of the greatest kings of Israel. But the Lord also, the Bible also told us his secret. And that's what I want to show you. Why you must embrace God's help. Because you see, as a child of God, you cannot help yourself. And you cannot achieve great things the way unbelievers achieve it. Unbelievers can do anything they like. They can go anywhere they like. They can do terrible things. You cannot do all those things. So for you, the hand of God must be revealed and made manifest in your life. Second Chronicles chapter 26. I'm going to read the story from verse 1. And just for us to enjoy it, and then I will speak on it, and we will round up for today, because that's the message I have. Now look at this. He says, all the people of Judah took Uzziah. Uzziah is the man we want to talk about. His father was the king. The father had died. He was the heir apparent. So all the people of Judah took Uzziah, that is the, the prince, the son of the king, who was 16 years old. And what did they do? And made him king in place of his father Amaziah. Let's go. Now, begin to look at this young man that became king at the age of 16. He said, he rebuilt Eloth and restored it to Judah after Amaziah, the king, rested with his fathers. So he started, you know, building cities and doing great things. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned for 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah. She was from Jerusalem. I'm just going to read it and you'll pick the points by yourself. He did what was right in the Lord's sight as his father Amaziah had done. He served God throughout the lifetime of Zechariah. The teacher, okay, he sought God throughout the lifetime of Zechariah, the teacher of the fear of God. During the time that he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Uzziah went out to wage war against the Philistines, and he tore down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabneh. 
God helped him against the Philistines. Who helped him? The Arabs, the Philistines, the Arabs that live in Gobal and the Munites. The Ammonites gave Uzziah tribute money and his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt. For God made him very powerful. Who made him very powerful? God can help people. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The story of this man is the story of, the pers- of just a man that God helped. But you will still see it. Let's go. Uzziah built what? Towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, the valley gate, and the corner buttress, and he fortified them. Since he had many cattle, both in the lowlands and in the plain, he built towers in the desert and dug many wells. And since he was a lover of the soil, he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands. Uzziah had an army equipped for combat that went out to war by division according to the assignment, as recorded by Jael, the court secretary, and Messiah, the officer under the authority of Ananiah, one of the king's commanders. The total number of heads of families was 2,600 brave warriors. Under their authority was an army of 307,500 equipped for combat a powerful force to help the king against the enemy. Uzziah provided the entire army with shields, spears, helmets, armor, bows, and sling stones. Now, this is where I'm going now. All the story. He made skillfully designed devices in Jerusalem to shoot arrows and catapult large stones for use on the towers and on the corners. Now, this is where I'm going. So his fame spread even to the distant places. Why? For he was what? Marvelously helped until he became strong. One translation says until he became very good. He was marvelously what? Helped. When you embrace God's help, there is no limit to what you can achieve. There is no limit to how far you can go in any area of life. All you have to do is embrace God's help. And the Lord is saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Lord is telling us this morning that regardless of the trouble, regardless of the challenge, regardless of the confusion, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I want you to be rest assured in your heart. According to the words of the Lord Jesus, he said, in this world, we will do what? We will face tribulations. We will face many challenges. But the Lord is saying, I will never leave you. I don't know why the Lord has sent this word to us this morning, but it is for every one of us to keep it at the center of our heart. When we are faced with trouble, when the enemy is taunting us, when the enemy says, I will deal with you, when the enemy says, you will, whatever the enemy is saying, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never abandon you. Let's go back to that scripture. There is now one last bit I want to, I want to read. That Hebrews chapter 13. Go to verse 6. I'm going to read that place and then we will close. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13. 16. Now go to verse 16. Verse 6, sorry. He says, I will not be afraid. Look at what he now put. What can man do to me? If the Lord is with us, eh, it does not matter who is against us. Hallelujah. God is with you. Amen. It does not matter who is against you. Some people say, oh, there are some powerful people that are against me. They are very, they have spiritual powers. I agree that they might have spiritual powers, but what can man do to me? When the Lord is with you, imagine a, a, a little boy with a father that is strong and some other little children are coming to attack him. The father, do you think the father will just be looking? He will be watching them attack his son. What will he do? He will defend his son. That's how we are with the Lord. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with me. It does not matter who is against me. There is nothing man can do against you. Whether they try to do it spiritually, whether they try to do it physically, 
the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. I will trust in him. You know, there, there's a part of the scripture that I love. He said, I will trust in you and I will not be afraid. And you know, I love, I think it was the moon that sang it into, that made it into a song. He says, I will trust in you. I will what? I will not be afraid. Put your hand on your chest and say, Lord, no. I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. Say it again. Lord, no. I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. Let somebody say amen. In one word, I want you to pray. We're rounding up. I just have a message. I don't have a long teaching today. Lord, I will trust in you. I want you to speak to the Lord where you are sitting. And say, Lord, the tide might be against me now. The situation might seem against me. Lord, I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. In the name of Jesus. Come and pray now. Come and pray. Pray. That's why we're in church. We're in church to receive the word of God and also to pray. Lord, I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. You need to pray. You need to pray. I want you to mention that trouble, that challenge to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, but I will not be afraid. I trust in you, Lord. It is between you and the Lord. So mention it to the Lord. And say, Lord, I, you know what I'm going through. You know all things. You know this area has been a challenge in my life. This area has been a trouble for me. Lord, I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Even in the face of trouble and challenges, Lord, I will trust in you. I will not be afraid. Hey, Lord, brother, get center of it all is you that I see is you that I see at the center of it all is you that I see about the power of God that is at work in us who believe. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible talks about the power of God. And this is one of the reasons why we continue to trust God. Because he has power. Hallelujah. We trust him because, not only because he has promised, but because he has power to fulfill his promises. And the Bible talks about the power of resurrection. The power that is at work in those of us who believe. Hallelujah. Amen. And in one minute you are going to pray. Lord, let your power be at work in me. Let it flow into every area of my life. In the name of Jesus, let your power be activated in me. Lord, to bring a change, to bring solutions to my challenges, to my troubles. In the name of Jesus. Come and pray now. Come and pray. Come and pray. Hail in the brim of Gendelia Brimos and Delia. Holy Labregate O Gendelia Brimos and Delia. Hail in the Brigade O Gendelia Brimos and Delia. 
Holy le brigado jendele abri ma 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 ha mali le brigado jendele in the in the brigado mon jendele abri ma 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 Ephesians chapter three verse twenty. Come on, keep praying, keep praying. Ephesians chapter three verse twenty. I want you to lay your burdens before the Lord this morning. Just lay your burdens before the Lord. The Lord has promised that He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. The Lord will activate His power that is at work in us. Now to Him that is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. According to the power that works in you. There is a power that is at work in you as a child of God. Lord, let there be an activation of the power of God in me. Let the power of God in me be activated. The Bible says God has power to do what he has promised to do. The power of God is strong enough to bring to fulfillment what God has promised. Lord, let there be a quickening. Let there be a coming alive in me. In the name of Jesus. Come on, be prayer, be prayer, be prayer. There is a power that is at work in you, friends. You have the right to activate it. The Lord said He will never leave you. He said He will never forsake you. So pray now. Let your power be quickened in me. Let your power come alive in me. Negebo Jendeli Abrimo Satalia. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Oh, Renin de Gebregedu Jendeli. Metekeli Ambregedu Jendeli Abramurunka. Linda Bregedu Jendeli Abrimo my Santi. Nine in the Bregedu Jendeli Abrimo my Santi in the cave. Yegebo Jendelia. The Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Jesus from the dead shall quicken your mortal body. He shall give life to your mortal body by spirit that dwells in him. I render the Lord, let your power bring life in me. In the name of Jesus. Come on, you can pray better than you are praying. You can pray better than you are praying. You can pray better than you are praying. Embrace the help of God. I don't know the area of your life where you need help, where you need God to intervene, where you need God to step in. Why don't you pray now? The Lord says His help is available. He said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. He said, He has made His help available. Why don't you embrace that help now? And say, Lord, I seek your help. Lord, step into my situation. Let there be a change, let there be a turnaround. Let the story change. In the name of Jesus, lay barude ge barre ge du jendeli, malibo jendeli abri mama, makapo jendeli abri mama zente. Hey, linda barre ge du jendeli abri mama. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse forty five. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse forty five. The first Adam was a living soul. The last Adam is a life giving spirit. The last Adam is a life giving spirit. Let the power of the Holy Ghost be, a, be activated in me. Let the life of the Spirit of God be activated in me. May go out, Shendeli, every moment, Satan. Child of God, you need to pray now. Child of God, you need to pray. This is the hour of grace. This is the hour that the Lord wants to pour Himself into us. He wants to step in and help us. Why don't you allow Him to help us? Why don't you ask for His help this morning? Hello, Shendeli, and the Lord, Shendeli. He said, I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me to do? Come and pray now. Come and pray. Come and pray. That's why we are here.
want you to begin to thank God. Mention the situation to God and say, Lord, I thank you. The Bible says, in all things we should give thanks. For this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. We give thanks because we know that He can answer all prayers. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 4, the Bible says, Abraham was fully persuaded that God has power to do what he has promised. God has power. Lord, I thank you. I see a new song coming into your life. I see testimonies filling your mouth. I see you triumphing this year. The Lord said in this church, we are going to triumph greatly this year. We are going to triumph greatly. You are going to triumph greatly. I see you triumphing. I see you ruling over the enemy. I see you walking in grace and in favor. I see the power of God manifesting in your life. I see you silencing the enemy. Come and be in prayer and say, Lord, I thank you. Your word is here and amen. Lord, I believe.